Thank you. The title of my talk, no longer an optional extra doing LGBTI policy differently, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex health policy differently, raises a number of questions. First of all, it raises the question, do we have a, an approach to LGBTI health policy in Australia? Do we have a consistent dominant approach? If the answer is yes, what characterises that approach? How does policy construct LGBTI people and sexual orientation and gender identity as objects of public policy? And the third question is, if there is a, a dominant approach, why question it? Should we consider um, policy doing LGBTI differently? Now, over the last 15 years in Australia, and particularly in Victoria, there's been increasing interest on the part of government to do LGBTI health policy, which at the very least suggests that at least at a government level, there's an acknowledgement that there's something about being LGBTI that separates that group off from the mainstream and that warrants a, a particular policy approach and perhaps in some instances, um, separate LGBTI related health policies and initiatives. However, in this talk, I want to argue that the word doing in doing LGBTI policy differently reflects the very ambiguous position of LGBTI people in health policy currently in Australia. Now, doing can have two meanings. It can have a passive meaning, which means to be done over or done by, or it can have an active meaning, that is to do or to take control. And I want to argue that currently LGBTI health policy in Australia locates LGBTI people as an ambivalent object, as both subjects and objects of policy. And I want to argue, and this is my big idea, that there are three phases to um, the way in which policy has framed LGBTI people and that currently we're stuck at the second phase. And I want to argue that that stuckness or inability to move into a third phase is actually starting to have a negative health impact on LGBTI people. What I also want to say is that the way in which policy understands the difference or what, how policy understands LGBTI people to be different from the mainstream and how that difference is understood to impact on the health of LGBTI policy marks these three different phases. Now, the first phase I've called repulsion, the second I've called tolerance, and the third I've called celebration. And I want to take you through each of those three phases. The first stage is repulsion. The first time that LGBTI people are really considered in policy in the 1950s and 1960s, they're constructed really as pathological or criminal objects. And the aim of policy is either to convert them to heterosexuality through medical interventions or to keep them underground through various forms of criminal sanctions and punishments. And I want to read a quote from uh, a book by Lee Edelman called Homographesis, which was written in 1994, in which Edelman reports on two um, United Kingdom psychiatrists who are attempting to convert a homosexually active man to heterosexuality. And I'll read the quote. Two British psychiatrists are using the Pavlovian conditioned reflex theory to change homosexual orientations. The patient who has evidenced interest in marrying and raising a family was placed in a darkened room and a photograph of an attractive male was flashed on the screen. The patient was given eight seconds to change the picture and if he failed to do so then the physician gave him an electric shock, strong enough to be considered extremely unpleasant. The shock continued until the patient removed the picture. By this method the doctors hoped to stop the habit of gazing at or thinking about male partners." End of quote. Clearly in this period the focus in policy is really not a concern for LGBTI people or their health and well-being. The focus is clearly on protecting the integrity and normality of the population at large from homosexual contagion. The second um, period I'm going to call tolerance and I'd like to thank Catherine for inspiring this quote. Tolerance is marked by we have no problem with the gays and lesbians as long as they don't and you can fill in the don't, as long as they don't marry, as long as they don't flaunt it, as long as they don't ram it down our throats. In this period, there's a growing awareness and acknowledgement of LGBTI people. And over time, there's a movement from what I would call disgust to pity, to a growing awareness of the impact of discrimination on LGBTI people's health and well-being. So in this period, I want to say, LGBTI people are constructed within policy as objects or effects of homophobic and transphobic abuse. Policy only considers LGBTI people insofar as um, they are objects of discrimination that has an impact on their health and well-being. 
Now in this period you get a focus particularly on um, LGBTI young people because there was a growing body of research showing they were particularly vulnerable to the effects of heterosexist discrimination and abuse. Now I want to refer to three particular projects that came out of this. One is the Writing Themselves In research conducted by Lynn Hillier at Arches at La Trobe. And the first Writing Themselves In was conducted in 1998. And what it showed was that same-sex attracted and gender questioning, that's the terminology used for these reports, young people, were at increased risk of the effects of homophobic discrimination and abuse, including increased risk of self-harm, increased risk of drug and alcohol misuse, increased risk of dropping out of school and so on. By 2010, when the third iteration of Writing Themselves In was done, we saw dramatic improvements in the, in, in the situation of this population. However, we still saw really high rates of homophobic and transphobic abuse, and again, we saw high rates of self-harm. Um, of dropping out of school and so on. So in that research, these young people are still being framed as victims of abuse. And I'm not saying that's a negative thing, I'm saying this is a stage. The second project I want to talk about that fits into this period is something called the Healthy Equal Youth Project, which has only been very recently funded by the Victorian Government. And that's a $4 million initiative over four years, from I think 2011 to 2015. And what the Healthy Equal Youth Project is meant to do, it's meant to skill up the capacity of mainstream youth services in Victoria to deal with the needs of same-sex attracted and gender-questioning young people. And GLHV, where I sit, had the responsibility of drawing up that project brief. And what it meant to do, what it intended to do, was take seven agencies that already have a focus on LGBTI young people, increase their capacity and then integrate them into the mainstream service sector for, for young people. Now, those seven partner agencies all were looking at the upstream determinants of what led to poorer mental health for this particular population group. Nonetheless, the funding stream that it comes out of was the suicide prevention funding from the government. So despite the efforts of the, the seven agencies to see it more as a capacity and workforce project, it nonetheless was funded out of a model that still looked at these young people as primarily victims. And the third um, indication, if you like, policy indication of this period of tolerance are the shifts that have gone on in gay men's HIV AIDS prevention. Since about nine, early on, since the, the mid 80s, the focus of HIV prevention was primarily on disease and on preventing the transmission of HIV among men and between homosexually active men and the population at large. That was a disease model. However, by the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a growing awareness of the effects of discrimination on gay men's ability or willingness to take responsibility for their sexual health. There was a dramatic shift. And I'll quote from a, a, a policy document that again GLHV authored called Something Borrowed, Something New, which was the Victorian HIV AIDS strategy that was addressing increased rates of HIV that had begun to emerge around 2001. And this report said, while homophobia continues to shape cultural and sexual norms, efforts to improve gay men's health and wellbeing, including efforts to change gay men's sexual practices, will be severely compromised. So even in that report, there's an acknowledgement that if you're subject to discrimination and that becomes part of the background of your life, you may actually be, have a decreased willingness and ability actually to take responsibility of your sexual health. So all of those three initiatives demonstrate, I would argue, a shift from repulsion to tolerance, where I'm understanding tolerance as we will deal with LGBTI people insofar as they are effects of homophobic discrimination and abuse. The third age I want to call celebration. And I want to argue that this age marks a radical transformation in how we think about LGBTI people within policy. And put, put briefly, I want to suggest that celebration suggests that being LGBTI is a social good and should be recognised as such in its own right. Inclusion of GLBTI people as a special needs group in the Commonwealth Age Care Act 2013 reflects, I would suggest, some of this shift. Um, at GLHV, we're developing a national LGBTI inclusive practice accreditation framework, which says of agencies, what are you doing to address the needs of this group as part of the diversity of the population as a whole? And I'd also suggest that growing support for same-sex marriage marks a shift into celebration. So, for example, in a Galaxy poll conducted in 2010, 30% of Australians supported same-sex marriage or equal love. Sorry, that was in 2004. By 2010, the percentage had jumped to 62%. And in 2010, 80% of 18 to 24-year-olds across Australia supported same-sex marriage. 
So what I want to argue is that this represents a shift in social attitudes that is yet to be taken up by policy. I want to suggest that policy is still stuck in that second period of tolerance and the very stuckness or inability of policy to move into and reframe LGBTI people in terms of celebration may actually be now contributing to a reduction in health, particularly in some subpopulations within the LGBTI community. What I want to say about each of these ages, or I could call them phases, and you'll see why I do that at the end, um, each of these phases is that they represent the dominant beliefs and practices of the time in which they were a part. So the 1960s, repulsion, the 1970s and 80s and 90s, tolerance, something new, celebration. So what I want to do is I want to give you two examples from research we've done at GLHV that demonstrate how this inability to move on might be compromising LGBTI people's health and wellbeing in the 2010s. The first of the results of a survey we conducted in 2008 called Coming Forward, which was a report on rates of homophobic and transphobic abuse in Victoria. And what we found is that between 1998 and 2008, although there'd been major shifts in legislative and social policy around LGBTI people, the rates of violence against this population had remained unchanged. So the first thing the research suggests is you can have legislative reform, but there's a lag in social reform and changing of attitudes. And I'll give you just two sets of data. So according to Coming Forward, one in seven LGBTI respondents reported living in fear of heterosexist violence. It's 2008 in Victoria. 85% of respondents had experienced heterosexist violence in their lifetime. And seven in 10 LGBTI respondents had experienced an, int uh, an incident of heterosexist violence while alone in the two years prior to completing the survey. The other thing that coming forward showed was there was virtually no social sites where LGBTI people weren't subject to heterosexist violence or weren't uh, anticipated the possibility of such violence. So if we looked at even in their own home, so you can go through a number of sites. We did streets, venues, home, friends home, across all of these there was a real risk of people actually experiencing violence. So what we argued from coming forward is, rather than focus on dramatic forms of physical and sexual abuse against this population, which a lot of research had done, we suggested that actually LGBTI people grow up in a culture of just assumed heterosexist harassment, and that that background culture actually constitutes part of who and what they are. So it's harassment, it's um, ongoing non-physical forms of abuse such as verbal abuse. So we argued that those more dramatic forms of physical and sexual assault rely on this everyday culture of heterosexist abuse. And that while you vo focus on GLBTI people as victims, you never actually put in place initiatives that address really those deeply embedded prejudices that frame the background to LGBT people's everyday lives. The second report is um, Private Lives 2, sorry, which was the second national survey of the health and wellbeing of LGBT people, which we released in 2012. So it's an Australian-based survey. What we did, we looked at um, the physical health and the mental health of LGBT people, and we, we compared that to the population as a whole. And what we found is between Private Lives 1, which was released in 2006, and Private Lives 2 in 2012, the physical health of LGBT people was getting closer and closer to the population as a whole. However, the mental health of LGBT people had not shifted between 2006 and 2012, and it was much worse than the population as a whole. So LGBT people still had higher rates of poorer mental health, they had higher rates of psychological distress, and they had higher rates of anxiety and depression than the population as a whole. And over a quarter of LGBT respondents have been diagnosed with or treated for an anxiety disorder in the 12 months prior to the survey, which is an enormous percentage. So what we argued is that the reason we see this lag between improvements in physical health and mental health of this population is precisely to do with that background culture of heterosexist violence that we saw in coming forward that until we stop focusing on GLBT people as victims as the effects of um, heterosexist violence and look at the more deeper underlying causes, um, GLBT people are not going to have the sort of improvements in mental health that we expect. So what I want to conclude by saying, and I'd want to read this if that's all right, it's my one bit of formal presentation. Um, what I want to say is what is needed now are not only initiatives that provide services to the victims of homophobic and transphobic abuse, what is needed now is not only legislative and social reforms and public education campaigns that target deeply held prejudicial attitudes towards LGBTI people, 
What it needed now is a new approach in which these initiatives sit under a policy framework that tells the entire population that LGBTI people are valued and a unique part of the diversity that makes up a shared humanity. What is needed is an approach that gives positive social value and weight to how we, as LGBT people, do our own lives, how we choose to live and love. What is needed is to take that straight line that opened this talk to bend it to serve all our purposes, to imagine a world over the rainbow where repulsion and tolerance were just a phase we were all going through, a world in which the particularities of doing LGBTI have everything to do with difference and diversity and nothing to do with prejudice and discrimination. Thank you.